first thing I felt was pride because I'd always wanted to do that and I was really proud to have uh, got in the seat and actually been able to fly it. Developed during the Cold War by Britain, West Germany and Italy, this fast jet has been the backbone of the RAF since 1982. As more than 40 years of combat service draws to a close, we take a look at this iconic combat aircraft and what it meant to the pilots who flew it and risked their lives in combat. I don't think anybody would ever, ever say it was the most beautiful aeroplane they'd ever flown or the most, uh, most agile, but uh, it did its job, it did it well. So it was, it was quite a complex beast. Uh, it was a lot of new stuff, not just for me as a young pilot, but for anybody going on to it, it had a lot of new technology. Uh, it wasn't just a question of light the engines and off you go. To, it would take a good 40 minutes to get it started up. If you go back to the 80s, it was uh, high to the Cold War, the threats were, uh, were, were, were pretty thick um, around the Iron Curtain, so the idea was to go in fast and low, ideally in bad weather or at night, and, and get underneath the defence system. So you practice day in, day out, flying low and fast. Um, and we used to go to Canada and even up in northern Scotland where you could go and train in cloud at pretty much down to 200 feet, 500 knots, hands off. That was uh, pretty scary stuff. The aircraft behind me is a Tornado GR1, the original RAF standard. Everything about this aircraft is specialised for fast, low-level flight and the delivery of unguided conventional and nuclear weapons. The RB199 engines at the rear of the Tornado are not only extremely compact, but designed to give maximum thrust at low altitudes to enable supersonic dash, even though this meant sacrificing performance at medium and higher altitudes where most fighters are optimised. One of the Tornado's most distinctive features is its variable sweep swing wings, which when swept back like this, allow supersonic speeds at low level and a very smooth ride for pilots, even in dense turbulent air, but could be swept forwards to allow takeoff and landing on short runways, even with heavy weapons and fuel loads. The nose here contains one of the most important features of the Tornado GR1 and GR4, the terrain following and ground attack radar, which is what allowed the jet its core capability to automatically fly at very low altitudes down valleys or other terrain in bad weather or at night and deliver unguided conventional or nuclear bombs with very high precision for its day. However, in so doing, the jet lacked the normal air-to-air -air radar, which gives most fighters their situational awareness. Compared to other aircraft that have flown before that, that once you get airborne, and you get the aircraft cleaned up and you're flying at low level. It's really quiet um, and almost uh, divorced from the kind of environment around you. So something kind of quite special and at the time it felt really modern as well and kind of uh, right up there with all the technology that was around. The aeroplanes were straight from the factory uh, floor, so uh, all nice and shiny. Almost like taking your brand new car out of the, uh, the dealership, so uh, lots of fun. The Tornado was designed to be easier to fly so you could spend more time operating it. So it was a, designed to be a war machine in the air. You could do things on the Tornado from the second, literally, you got airborne to the second you landed, which you couldn't do in other aircraft. It was very forgiving. And once you got to know it, it was, a, it was an absolute joy to fly. In order to cope with the demands of flying complex, low-level attack missions, both nuclear and conventional, with 1980s technology, the Tornado was designed around a crew of two, a weapon systems operator in the rear seat and the pilot in the front seat. The one thing that, that sticks with me, with me though, which makes me really pleased that I was flying with someone else, was firstly, during an operational situation, it meant you were never, you were never alone. When, when the heat was on, there was always someone who had your back and vice versa. I think secondly, it uh, developed a particular sense of camaraderie between colleagues and within the squadron. Uh, and lastly, it also taught you the value, the real important value of teamwork not just in flying the aircraft, but actually subsequently in everything that you do as well. So those things are probably gone. Other things are probably here to stay. It's a difficult one for a backseater to answer that, but, but in truth, a lot, of, um, a lot of technology has changed since the, the advent of the Tornado, and there are, there are lots of things that can be done by technology. But the advantage of having a second bloke in the cockpit is you've got a team, you've got a built-in team, whether you're airborne or on the ground, you've got two heads thinking about stuff, you've got two heads to look out of the aircraft, which is very important indeed, and when you land, you've got two people on the ground to go to the party. I've flown both single seat and two seat, and, and I will be brutally honest with you, there's something quite special about flying single seat, because you, you very much feel like it's just you, and it's, it's, it's quite unique, but I am, I, I am a firm believer that two brains and are, are better than one. You, you, you had to work hard at it. You, in order to be a better pair, 
you, you had to know each other. You had to almost instinctively know what each other was going to do. It wasn't a, a question and answer session. You, you literally anticipated what each of you was doing. And then when you got that, that synergy between the pair of you really humming, you were definitely more capable than a, than a single seat. Um, obviously these days there are more sensors and systems, more artificial intelligence creeping in that will begin to make some of those decisions for the crews. But in, in those days we didn't have that. When you had a crew working well, it was quite something. And when, it, when you go to a reunion, um, you, you can very quickly see the pilot and the navigator who'd been crewed together. They'll be in the corner drinking a beer together. RAF tornadoes took significant losses during the first Gulf War, conducting daring low-level attacks on airfields and other Iraqi targets. Following this conflict, the RAF increasingly re-rolled the tornado to the safer medium-level role. The integration of precision-guided munitions, as well as upgraded avionics and sensors, gave birth to the GR4 standard, which still serves with the RAF in 2019, and has done so with distinction in multiple conflicts, delivering precision-guided munitions and even cruise missiles. It was uh, an excellent upgrade of the nav system, but also an inclusion of a forward-looking infrared suite as well, which allowed us to fly at night. If you remember that, we'd previously had yeah. uh, night vision goggles, but we'd rarely used them really, but we, we now had a completely compatible cockpit. But I do remember the first time when we flew from RAF Bruggen across to the UK and we dropped into low level over the Scottish border. It was, it was a beautiful night, night vision goggles, manually flying the aircraft at 250 feet. That was some rush. It really was incredible. And to me, that really brought the aircraft to life because not only could we do that, but we could then go from visual flying to instrument flying all at low level all below the radar, which really kind of brought the capabilities of the aircraft right to the fore. It was absolutely incredible experience. The other RAF version of the Tornado was the F-3. This air defence fighter was created on the basis of the GR-1 by adding an extra fuselage stretch to accommodate air-to-air -air missiles, a new radar for air-to-air -air work, as well as uprated engines designed to perform better in the high altitude role and give greater thrust and reheat. While the F-3 did eventually mature into a capable interceptor, it could never directly compete with the performance of purpose-designed air superiority fighters like the American F-15. It was an interesting comparison between the Tornado F3 and the GR1 that it was basically developed from. The Tornado F3 uh, was arguably uh, a more capable airframe. It retained its supersonic capability because it had a six-foot plug pushed in behind the rear cockpit, and that carried extra fuel. The engines were larger, uh, more thrust, mostly in reheat thrust, to, to give it a better air combat capability. Once you went inside, then the two aeroplanes were entirely different. Uh, the weapon systems were completely different. The Tornado F3 was optimized for the air-to-air -air role, and indeed, until later on in its life, couldn't even drop, drop a bomb. One notable feature common to all Tornado variants is the affection with which its crews hold it, whether past or present. Some of the highlights, probably my, uh, my first tour on the squadron when I was combat ready and, and being put into, uh, into the quick readiness alert, which for the ground attack aircraft was the nuclear role. I remember going up and signing for my aeroplane with two nuclear weapons strapped under it for the first time and then, and then going into my hardened shell tour on 15 minute readiness to be launched to, uh, to go drop them. That was a pretty uh, momentous day, I remember. My first uh, operational sortie into Kosovo and being shot at by Serbian air defenders, clearly they missed. But uh, yeah, there, there, is, there are many, many, many uh, memories. Yes, in terms of um, particularly memorable sorties, we've got a few actually, but probably the most memorable one is the 25th of May 1999, when we flew a very interesting combat mission in, uh, in the war in Kosovo. And uh, we were leading, we were leading the formation and we had a, a particularly exciting time, which I think my learned colleague can now take over from. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a night um, uh, in Kosovo, the 25th of May, to the extent that we celebrate it every, every year. Uh, we've been there a couple of times before, uh, and in general terms, there was some action, but, uh, but we'd been left pretty much alone. Uh, and that night was particularly interesting because as we uh, coasted over the water and got into the operational area, um, our RHWRs lit up. And it was very difficult to differentiate what was spoof, what was real. There's a lot of jamming. It was a very active um, area of operations. All six of our aircraft uh, came under attack from surface to air missiles, which we all uh, saw visually. Um, and we ended up in different places. Uh, some of our colleagues managed to successfully evade the missiles and drop their ordnance on target, which was incredible. Some ended up in countries they shouldn't have been in for a short period of time during that night, just to get out of the line of fire. Uh, and we got back into Bruggen uh, with the help of our air to refueling colleagues um, a good four or five hours after that. So quite a night. And I think what that night brings home to me is a couple of things. Um, firstly, how your training as a crew kicks in automatically when the pressure 
is on, uh, but also uh, how well the aircraft performed that night. You know, we were performing that aircraft to the maximum limit that night on several occasions. Everybody came home, and I think uh, I think we're really grateful a, to ourselves for that, but also to the uh, to the airframe that we were in that night. I'd like to add something to uh, to that. That the um, it's worth noting we had two targets to attack that night, and despite the intensity of the surface-to-air fire, we hit both targets. And uh, Jockey and I were at the front between us. We were working very hard, and you can hear that on the tapes. You can hear us breathing very hard. A lot of G going on, a lot of very, very violent manoeuvres as we manoeuvre from about 25,000 feet down to a much lower level and then back up again. Um, but in the, the course of all of that, I, as the backseater in charge of uh, getting rid of the fuel tanks, was on the verge of jettisoning them, and I shouted that I was going to do that in order to free up the weight and therefore allow him more, more agility. And, uh, and Jockey shouted, don't. There's a little town down there. I know that's mad, but you know what I mean. So we hung on to them for a little bit longer, putting ourselves in jeopardy, really, just to make sure that we didn't inflict any collateral damage on that village below us. The Tornado remains a potent and capable strike fighter, even today, but it can no longer compete with the most modern fighter and air defense threats. The roles fulfilled for so long by the GR4 in RAF service are now being taken over by the more modern, capable and multi-role Eurofighter Typhoon as well as the RAF's latest strike fighter, the stealthy F-35. Nonetheless, the Tornado will be much missed in RAF service, and its legacy of flexibility and combat effectiveness stretching across decades will be a hard act to follow, even for those modern contemporaries that operate today from Marham, Coningsby and Lossiemouth. So I think, firstly, I've got a feeling of real pride to be involved in a really significant part of the Air Force's operational history on one of the finest aircraft that the Air Force has produced, in my opinion. In terms of the aircraft I've flown, it's the one that I've been most comfortable to go on operations with. And also in terms of the experiences I've had with Stu uh, uh, and other folks that I've flown it as well. Yeah, amazing. So, so, so really proud to have been a part of it. It's the only jet I ever wanted to fly. I got to fly it. I didn't fly any other uh, frontline aircraft. And uh, I'm just really proud of, um, of what we've done together, but all of the other guys in the force as well. And a little bit sad. It's coming to the end of an era. It's been around a long time. It's done a fantastic job. We've been part of it, and uh, I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah, well, I retired two years ago, so Tornado not only came into service about a year before I did, it, it, it left two years after I did, so it, it, out, it outlived me. And you could argue that's, uh, that's probably long enough. I mean, it, it's still doing a great job, and uh, there's still a little bit of life left in the old girl yet, but, uh, you know, it, it's had its time. Um, new aircraft are coming online now with new t new capabilities and, and, and you can't keep running on old things just because you want to. There comes a time when you have to transition onto the new systems and new weapons. The threats out there now are very different to the ones I faced when I was a young man. And uh, I, I think, you know, whilst it will be sad to see it go, other nations, of course, will operate it a little bit longer. But um, yeah, it, it, it'll be a good party and, uh, and she'll have had a great life. And to be honest, she's, uh, she's had a very, very long operational career. She probably needs a rest. Thank you.